Well, um, thank you for uh, coming to uh, Kansas Center Grand Rounds. And um, I actually have the privilege of being able to give Grand Rounds uh, today. I, it's my turn in the rotation. So it's very kind of you all to come and, and listen. Um, this is now uh, concluding my 10th uh, month at Yale. And I can tell you, I, it's just been such a privilege working with so many of you. We have such an extraordinary center. And if I learned anything, and I learned a few things from preparing the 2,500-page document that went to the National Cancer Institute on September 25th, is just the sheer depth and accomplishment that we have at Yale. And so it's really a privilege to be part of, of that organization, of our faculty and staff, of what we're doing clinically and research and otherwise. So what I uh, want to do is, over the next 50 minutes or so, is share with you um, work I've done over my career. And in some respects, it's uh, a little schizophrenic in its approach, in that um, I, uh, like many people in the room, I did a uh, postdoctoral fellowship in a very basic laboratory after my clinical training, um, and then um, went to be a chief resident after that at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and decided that, albeit I wanted to be doing research, I didn't want to study cell cycle regulation because, frankly, many people in this room are much smarter at that than I am. Um, and although the phenomenon of big data didn't exi exist, I thought, well, you know, I'm a clinician and I see lots of patients, and we have lots of patients in the facility, can we use the technologies that we are developing in the lab, and this is now the early 90s, to, um, to studying cancer on a much grander scale with great statistical power, something that I think we're very familiar with doing now, um, to which I learned from. And I, it, for me, it was a learning process. It was learning after the basic lab epidemiology and biostatistics. So in some respects, you'll see the talk I give will be in three parts of really what my career has been, which is sort of uh, very basic epidemiology of colon cancer, and then trying to marry that to what we know in terms of the treatment and practice in oncology. And then lastly, and really most exciting, is how we leverage that to understanding biology. So um, the premise of all of this uh, starts with some very clear observations of the statistics of cancer. Uh, namely, uh, this year, the American Cancer Society expects about 135, 140,000 cases of colorectal cancer and about 50,000 deaths, making it a major uh, cause of the burden of cancer in the United States and, frankly, beyond that worldwide. There is an interesting phenomenon which has existed for ages which is that in contrast to the West, the developed parts of the world, the incidence of colorectal cancer in under, underdeveloped parts of the world is 40 times less. Now, some people will say that's because they don't know how to diagnose colon cancer. I assure you it's not. Some people say it's because they don't live long enough to get colon cancer. Well, if you look at age-specific incidence, it's 40 times less. Um, and then some people will say it's just because they're genetically different. They're not at risk for getting colon cancer. But in fact, if you look at migration studies, people who emigrate from the underdeveloped parts of the world to the U.S. assume the same risk of colorectal cancer as we all enjoy uh, within a generation. So presumably it was something they were exposed and something that I wanted to study uh, when I first got out of the lab and wanted to learn how to manage data. And the the laboratory that I was able to move into were these cohort studies, these national cohort studies funded by the NIH. The Nurses' Health Study, which started in 1976 when 176, 121,700 individuals, fe female registered nurses, completed a 16-page questionnaire on diet, lifestyle, uh, medical history, uh, a variety of other things, uh, and did so every two years. They also provided blood samples. Um, and, uh, and all their medical records as part of follow-up. In 10 years later, a companion male study of about uh, 52,000 male health professionals, a national cohort was similarly uh, started. And when I joined them in the early 90s, what I convinced them was you're sitting on a gold mine, start collecting tumors. Because these cohorts, as you may be aware, were not created to study cancer. 
They were created to study heart disease. Uh, and they actually fundamentally understood uh, heart disease as a result, uh, but they were obviously uh, similarly the opportunity to study cancer. And so some of the first things I got involved with was looking at the diet data. This is what they assigned me to do, um, and understand uh, what are the dietary risk factors for cancer. Because, in fact, all these data were collected when they were perfectly healthy, right? These 121,000 women completed a 131-item food frequency questionnaire, which was validated about what they ate, and they, they would just follow it over time to see who would get colon cancer. So a prospective observation, one of the questions was beef, pork, or lamb as a main dish. There are six questions on red meat. This is one of them. And as you can see, with increasing consumption of beef, pork, or lamb, there was an increasing risk of colorectal cancer in the nurses, such that the nurses who consumed red meat once a day were 2.7 times more likely to develop colon cancer. Since that time, a litany of studies have shown that red meat is a risk factor for colon cancer, and moreover, uh, various organizations internationally have established red meat consumption as an established risk factor for this cancer. Um, similarly, another difference between the West and underdeveloped parts of the world is sedentary lifestyle. <coughs> There is a one-page questionnaire on physical activity, uh, what activities they do for how long and how often. And from that, you can actually get a metabolic equivalent score for each activity and how many hours per week, so a net hours per week. As you see, with increasing regular physical activity, there is a diminishing risk of colon cancer over the 20-year follow-up, such that, in this case, the participants who were exercising about three times a week we're 50% less likely to get colon cancer, and now 52 subsequent studies have similarly shown that regular physical activity reduces the risk of colorectal cancer. Related to activity is, uh, is obesity. One can measure adiposity through a variety of means. One is just standard body mass index. The questionnaire to the nurses and the health professionals includes a tape measure with instructions of how to measure their waist to hip ratio, measure of central adiposity. And as you can see, with increasing central adiposity, there is an increasing risk of both colon cancer and colon adenomas, that is polyps one centimeter or greater, such that the individuals in the highest level of adiposity were almost three and a half times more likely to develop colon cancer during a 20-year follow-up period. And so, uh, as I mentioned, we want to understand the biology of these observations. We don't want to make them one-off things. And so we sort of wondered, why would obesity and sedentary lifestyle contribute to the risk of colon cancer? And one speculation that we had, one hypothesis among many, was the phenomenon of insulin resistance. As you know, obesity and sedentary lifestyle lead to a state of insulin resistance, meaning that you require more insulin to manage your blood sugar because obesity is an uh, insulin-resistant state. Um, and interesting because, as you, many of you know, in the lab, and this was true when I was in you know, a basic lab, you would often add insulin to the media to sustain the cells. Uh, they can be quite uh, helpful for the life of a cancer cell. So could chronic hyperinsulinemia as a result of obesity and sedentary lifestyle be in part contributing to risk? So. We actually, as I mentioned, we have bloods. And this was actually yet another cohort of men that we were managing, the Physician's Health Study, where we looked at their baseline level of C-peptide, which, by the way, is a long-term proxy of how much insulin you make. And as you can see, the physicians in the highest quintile of baseline C-peptide were almost three and a half times more likely to develop colon cancer. And that was adjusted for all the other things I mentioned, including their body habitus, their activity levels. And we also adjust for uh, insulin binding proteins. And we still see a significant risk, suggesting that perhaps this could be a mechanism by which to study which um, that work continues. It's uh, just on a separate note, it's, it's important, though difficult, to exercise and eat right, and people prefer to take pills. And there was, at the time that I was getting started, uh, ample evidence in the lab that aspirin and similar compounds actually can be somewhat stifling to the growth of colon cancer cells. And because the Nurses' Health Study, in part, was to look at the effect of aspirin on heart disease, we decided to look at the effect of aspirin on colon cancer because we had the data. 
and we had detailed data on aspirin use. So this is actually the amount of adult 325 milligram aspirin tablets that were taken by participants in the nurses' health study. And as you can see, with increasing aspirin use, there was a diminishing risk of colon cancer, a, what looks like a linear dose effect, such that those nurses who took more than 14 adult tablets per week were 32% less likely to develop colon cancer. And I realize that's a lot of aspirin. People ask me why were they taking that. We actually asked them, and the answer was not heart disease prevention, but headaches and musculoskeletal complaints. Um, but it was an interesting dose phenomenon, and um, I can tell you there have been now multiple uh, randomized trials that have been advanced following those initial observations, one being the British doctor's aspirin trial, 7,500 physicians randomized to aspirin or placebo, and what they found was that those randomized to aspirin had a 29% reduction in colorectal cancer over their follow-up period based on a number of level one evidence studies. Uh, this year, uh, the U.S. Preventative Task Force established aspirin as a uh, accepted chemo prevention agent for <coughs> colorectal cancer. Um, we also realize that aspirin has side effects, including GI bleeding. Can you, much like the cardiologist, risk stratify? Can you figure out who should take aspirin and who shouldn't? And one thing is aspirin is anti-inflammatory. Inflammation does promote uh, cancer, we think, in part. So what if you look at inflammatory factor? Now, much of this work in, the, in heart disease has been focused on C-reactive protein. I can tell you, even in the cardiovascular and the diabetes literature, Soluble TNF-alpha receptor 2 is actually a better circulating inflammatory cytokine than C-reactive protein in terms of its predictive value. It's just that it hasn't been well commercialized. But because it is a better factor, we looked at a variety, and much in terms of colon cancer, find that that circulating baseline and circ circulating uh, cytokine is a predictor. So this is in the nurse's health study. Those nurses in the fourth quartile of this inflammatory factor at baseline we're 67% more likely to develop colon cancer. So we wanted to see, can aspirin influence that elevated risk? So among the nurses who had a level of this inflammatory cytokine circulating level below the median, you can see there is a modest, if any, reduction in the risk of developing colon cancer, which is not statistically significant. But among the nurses who were, had a level above the median, the top 50th percent, you can see that those who took aspirin subsequently reduced their risk of colon cancer by 61%, suggesting that there could be some benefit in terms of risk stratification, and maybe there is a potential effect in terms of its anti-inflammatory effect. One obvious target for aspirin is cyclooxygenase 2, which, as you're aware, is, uh, in theory, uh, growth-promoting in terms of its pathway for colon cancer. About 75% of polyps and cancers overexpress COX-2. And so we actually wanted, because we were collecting the tumors in my lab and we were measuring COX-2 expression in the tumors, we wanted to ask the very simple question. Does aspirin preferentially prevent tumors that overexpress COX-2? Because if that's the mechanism, you would think that there would be a difference there. So um, we assessed COX-2 by immunistic chemistry in, uh, in our cohort in the tumors, and we asked this question. What we found was that uh, among the one-third of patients who have COX-2 negative tumors, aspirin really doesn't reduce their risk. It reduces it by 1%, which is not significant. But in terms of the ability of aspirin to prevent COX-2 overexpressing tumors, it reduces the risk, and it only just taking two aspirin per week. Um, that actually by itself reduced the risk of by 36% for COX-2 overexpressing tumors, suggesting that, uh, you know, supporting the case for causality and potentially mechanism by which uh, this might work. Um, the vitamin industry, when I got started, the multivitamin industry was and continues to be about a $24 billion industry in the U.S. with precious little data about the health benefits for multivitamins. Um, but, and I can actually tell you that people who take multivitamins do not reduce their risk of, of colon cancer unless that vitamin has a substantial dose of vitamin D because we were interested in vitamin D because you can actually show in the lab that 
Um, vitamin D receptor um, is present on colon cancer cells, and those cancers that overexpress the vitamin D receptor actually can be inhibited in their growth by the addition of vitamin D. That in xenograft models, many have shown that there is an inhibition of growth with vitamin D. Um, you can actually inhibit adenoma growth in APC min mice. And lastly, people have actually developed an APC min vitamin D receptor uh, deleted mouse. And uh, if you do that, um, they actually have profoundly more and larger polyps, suggesting perhaps that vitamin D may have an impact on these patients. So the easiest way to measure vitamin D is through blood levels. Um, 25 vitamin D circulating in the blood is the easiest way to measure the status of what your vitamin D level is. Many people in the U.S. are actually deficient. Um, so we measured it at baseline of the nurses, and what we found that was increasing levels of plasma vitamin D was associated with a significant reduction in their risk of colon cancer in such that the nurses who were in the highest level at a, about 35 nanograms per milliliter reduced their risk of colon cancer during the follow-up period of about 47% uh, for mortality of colon cancer, suggesting perhaps that at least this observation could stimulate studies, and there is now something called the VITAL study, a U.S. study, where healthy people are being randomized to uh, 25, or actually uh, vitamin D3 or placebo. Since our observation, there have been now multiple uh, prospective studies similarly looking at a plasma vitamin D and colon cancer risk. This meta-analysis shows a consistent effect, that is, people with higher levels seem to have a reduced risk. So um, in sum, on the risk side, a number of factors that I think explain this West sort of underdeveloped world observation, um, and that actually we can impact outcome for risk for patients, that is, through exercise, aspirin, vitamin D, uh, avoiding obesity, red meat, high glycemic load diets, alcohol, smoking, among other things. And forgive me if those of you have seen this slide in my talk before, but, you know, after doing a lot of studies on individual risk factors, because, you know, we want people to think about a healthful lifestyle, we actually looked in the health professionals follow-up study. This is the male cohort of well-educated health professionals to see about what would be the effect of a relatively uh, simple approach to a healthful lifestyle, which is avoiding obesity, exercising twice a week, taking a multivitamin that contains vitamin D, or just taking vitamin D alone, not having more than one alcoholic beverage per day, not smoking, and not having red meat more than twice a week, up to twice a week, fine. I, what I would suggest is six things that are not draconian, we're not saying eat hay, something that you know, would think well-educated health professionals would accept and recognize the benefit. Because by the way, one thing we do with the, question, with the study is we actually give them data. We send them the results in real time because we feel like for their participation they know it. So they've been seeing these studies. So anyone who hasn't seen this slide care to guess what proportion of these very well-educated people do this? 5%. So 3% actually um, did it, uh, and uh, among those brave souls, over the follow period, they had a 71% reduction in their risk of developing colon cancer, suggesting that primary prevention beyond the value of a colonoscopy and other things can have profound effect on the burden of colon cancer in this and other countries. So I mentioned the other aspect of my work was marrying what, what I learned in epidemiology in terms of risk to the fact that I'm a practicing medical oncologist. Because the reason I was motivated to try to link this is that there are data that show that 75% of new cancer patients believe there is a diet, supplement, or lifestyle that will improve their cure rate. Um, but uh, the truth is, is that we don't know what it is. And I will tell you, those same studies show that beyond 75% believing that there is something, they also believe that we won't tell them the answer. Um, now, we don't tell them the answer because we don't know the answer. Because people have not sought to do these kinds of rigorous studies among, health, among cancer patients, principally that's been done among healthy people. Um, so I um, decided in the late 90s to try to create a similar cohort for cancer patients. 
So uh, CLGB 89803 was a U.S. Uh, national cooperative group study in which 1,260 people with stage three colon cancer who had undergone a curative resection uh, were randomized to one of two post-operative adjuvant chemotherapy. So they all had a curative resection for a node positive stage three colon cancer, and they were followed uh, for recurrence after getting one of these two chemotherapies. I will tell you, if you don't know, the result was there was no benefit to adding CPT11 or renatecan. The arms were equivalent. So they all got standard chemotherapy, and there's actually no difference between the arms. But one thing I did by being an incredible pain in the neck at CLGB was convince them to let me get these people to complete this questionnaire. Um, and they assured me that it would never work, that no one would ever, no patient would ever want to fill the questionnaire out, and that it was actually going to compromise the conduct of this study, you know, because it was so arduous. But I created a system where we got it done. Doctors never actually saw the questionnaire, only the patients. And 98% um, completed the first questionnaire two months after enrollment, and 95% completed the second questionnaire uh, six months after adjuvant therapy. And we don't get that kind of uh, compliance with the nurse's health study. So these people were interested, um, and as long as I kept my colleagues in medical oncology out of the picture, we actually were able to collect <laughs> these data quite successfully. Um, and so we then had a database by which people completed these as questionnaires long before we knew who recurred, because the sad truth is, is that 35% of stage three colon cancer patients will have a recurrence of their cancer after surgery, many of whom sadly will succumb to the malignancy. So did anything they do during the time after their diagnosis with their diet and lifestyle matter? I mentioned to you the benefits of physical activity. We had the same questionnaire about physical activity in this cohort of stage three patients. And with increasing regular activity, there was a di diminishing uh, mortality. The most common activity was walking. Those patients who said they walked six hours or more per week reduced or improved their disease-free survival by 47%. Now, some would look at that data and say, well, you know, what does that mean? You know, healthy people exercise and sick patients don't. But let me be clear, all of these patients were cancer-free and had to be eligible for an NCI cooperative group study. They had to be ECOG, their performance status had to be zero to one. They had to be cancer-free by CAT scan, blood work, physical exam, everything. They had to be healthy or they wouldn't get into the trial. But, you know, I took the criticism appropriate, which is, well, maybe, you know, the, they weren't exercising because they were sick, and that's why exercise works, because sick people can't exercise, people who are destined to recur. So what we did is we repeated this analysis, and we said, okay, all the events, all the cancer occurrences that occurred within six months after they completed the questionnaire will eliminate. They're out. We're only going to look at recurrences that occur more than six months after the questionnaire because maybe during those six months, those are the people who recurred because they didn't exercise because they were sick. And we saw the exact same phenomenon. So then I said, okay, we'll eliminate everything that happened in the first year after the questionnaire, and we still see the same phenomenon. Um, and we've now done four other studies in colon cancer patients. Each of them show the same thing. Patients who exercise have a lower risk of cancer recurrence. So um, we looked at other things. We looked at obesity. I will tell you, obese colon pa cancer patients have a higher risk of recurrence. And then we started to look at the diet data. As I mentioned, there is a 131-item food frequency questionnaire. So when we got started, we decided to sort of dig into the diet data by looking at patterns. And through a sort of informatics approach, you can actually do something called a factor analysis where you say, okay, just break it up into two distinct dietary patterns. If you ever get a, da uh, a diet data from a U.S. population and you ask for two patterns, you'll always, always get the same two patterns, which are either a Western pattern, which consists of red meat, uh, sweets, desserts, French fries, refined grains, among other things, all the things we enjoy eating, as opposed to what is referred to as a prudent pattern, often characterized by fruits, vegetables, legumes, fish, poultry, whole grains, the things that are, quote, good for us. Um, and if you look at any other study that's done this, it's highly predictive for other health outcomes, be it heart disease risk, diabetes, or even the risk of getting colon cancer, a Western pattern diet being a risk factor for those things. 
So we wanted to ask, do these patterns of eating affect the outcome for patients recently treated for colon cancer? So when we look at the prudent pattern diet, with increasing prudent pattern diet, as you can see in this graph, we actually don't see a benefit. So increasing prudent pattern consumption doesn't affect their risk of cancer recurrence or cancer mortality. But when we looked at the Western pattern diet, an increasing consumption of a Western pattern diet significantly increased the risk of cancer recurrence and mortality, such that those patients who were in the highest quintile were four times more likely, three point times more likely, to have their cancer recur or die from their colon cancer. Um, and this is adjusted for all the other factors that I mentioned. It seems to be an independent factor that we see. Now, this isn't to say that our patients should be instructed to eat hay or avoid things, but I think, you know, for those individuals who just eat these profoundly unhealthful diets, uh, they're probably, it does seem to be driving some outcome in terms of the biology of their cancer. Now, I mentioned to you earlier in terms of risk, how do these things affect the biology of risk, how do they affect the outcome for patients? So why would obesity and sedentary lifestyle and a high Western pattern diet drive, um, drive risk? Again, speculating whether it could be hyperinsulinemia. So we looked at states of hyperinsulinemia. One of them is type 2 diabetes, which is the common variety of diabetes that afflict Americans. By the way, as you know, type 2 diabetes is not a phenomenon where you don't make insulin. You make lots of insulin. You just can't make enough of it to keep your blood sugar down. It's a phenomenon more commonly found in obese individuals, sedentary people. That is common type 2 diabetes. So we looked in a separate cohort of colon cancer patients and asked the question, do pa how do patients with type 2 diabetes do with stage 2 and 3 colon cancer? And as you can see, the diabetics have a worse five-year survival. Now, you might say, well, that's not surprising because type 2 diabetics have a higher risk of heart disease or stroke or other endpoints unrelated to cancer. But when you simply say, okay, let's isolate the outcome just to recurrence of their colon cancer, the diabetics are more likely to have a recurrence, leading us to speculate that maybe people with states of hyperinsulinemia have a higher risk of recurrence, a greater progression of cancer. So we looked at other things that drive uh, hyperinsulinemia Glycemic load is now a very common phenomenon in uh, the, the, the parlance of the lay public, you know, the Atkins diet, the South Beach diet, that is, that component of carbohydrates that drives glucose and insulin. So you can measure glycemic load in the diet, and we did, and those patients in our cohort who were in the highest quintile of dietary glycemic load were 80% more likely to have their cancer recur or die. And then lastly, we, beyond measuring all those other things, we just decided to measure insulin. As I say, the simplest way to measure it is to measure their baseline C-peptide in their blood. And what we found was that uh, the patients with the highest level of C-peptide were more than two times more likely to die from colon cancer, supporting the idea that this could be how these factors drive outcome. Moreover, their nature makes a natural antagonist to insulin Insulin, uh, insulin growth factor binding protein 1, which is an antagonist, a circulating antagonist to insulin. So we looked at that antagonist, and we find that with people in the highest quartile of the antagonist actually have a significant reduction in their mortality from colon cancer, again, supporting the hypothesis this pathway may be driving outcome. So uh, it was sort of uncanny. Everything that we looked at in this colon cancer cohort that drove the risk for type 2 diabetes seemed to impact uh, uh, the survival of these patients. So I, I had a free weekend a couple of years ago, and I decided to write an R01, where literally the premise of the R01 was, I'm going to look at all the risk factors for type 2 diabetes and see if they affect these patients with colon cancer. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty damn simple. That's why it literally took me a weekend to write this thing. But crazy as it sounds, it actually got funded. So, um, so uh, w among the examples I want to look at was there's ample evidence that people who drink sugar-sweetened beverages have a higher risk of type 2 diabetes, that there's now abundant evidence that coffee consumption reduces your risk of type 2 diabetes and heart disease. And then uh, this really gets peculiar. 
nut consumption reduces your risk of type 2 diabetes. Ample studies showing that, even randomized trials, showing that nuts reduce type 2 diabetes. So we asked these questions. So we asked about sugar-sweetened beverage consumption. And by the way, that is not a typo. M.A. Fuchs is not me. It's my son, Michael, who is a second-year Harvard medical student. And it's always important to plug your kids when you're giving grand rounds. So, um, so he looked at that. And what he found is that our patients who consume sugar-sweetened beverages were 70% more likely to have their cancer recur or die from colon cancer after adjusting for other factors. Um, I mentioned that coffee is associated with reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. Do patients who drink coffee do better? So we looked at 8-ounce servings, and with increasing consumption of coffee, there is a diminishing risk of cancer recurrence or mortality in these colon cancer patients. And then lastly, I mentioned that nut consumption has been shown to be a re reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes, so we looked at that similarly and increasing nut consumption reduced the risk of cancer recurrence in these patients. Now, you're probably thinking this guy must be like some kind of snake oil salesman, right? <laughs> but um, we really are trying to study this in a rigorous fashion and to do it systematically. And I think it does speak to the fact that energy balance pathways seem to drive the outcome for progression of these cancers. So you, beyond energy balance are the inflammatory pathways. I mentioned the benefit of aspirin in reducing risk. What happens with people who take aspirin after their diagnosis? So we looked in the same cohort at consistent aspirin users and non-users, and we found that the aspirin users had a 54% improvement in their disease-free survival. Um, related to aspirin are the COX-2 inhibitors, because I mentioned we think cyclooxygenase 2 is potentially the target here in colon cancer. Rofococcib, otherwise referred to as Vioxx, was on the market when CLGB-8903 was running. As you may know, it's off the market because of heart disease risk. But, um, and Celecoxib or Celebrex is still on the market. And at the time this study was going on, about 9% of these patients were taking a COX-2 inhibitor principally for uh, musculoskeletal complaints, not, not cancer, but osteoarthritis principally. And what we found was that people who took these pills at least three times per week improved their uh, disease-free survival by 56%, again, supporting the phenomenon that aspirin and related drugs may affect the natural history of these cancers. Um, I mentioned to you that we think inflammatory cytokines could define people at risk we then looked at soluble TNF alpha receptor 2 in these patients. And forgive me, it didn't, uh, didn't project very well, but what I can tell you is this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. As compared to the people in the highest quartile of this soluble cytokine at baseline, those in the lowest had a far superior survival uh, from colon cancer. And then we actually looked whether what the interaction between the baseline inflammatory factor is and aspirin use. So among, looking, this is looking at the effect of elevated soluble TNF in the blood. For those people who didn't take aspirin and had an elevated level, they were 2.3 times more likely to die from the colon cancer. But the people who had an elevated level who took aspirin actually um, did not have an elevated risk of anything. It looks like their risk was significantly reduced for cancer mortality, suggesting you could abrogate this effect uh, through aspirin and that potentially aspirin would be beneficial for those patients with elevated circulating inflammatory factors. Um, I mentioned to you that we think the target is cyclooxygenase 2, so we wanted to see whether COX-2 expression in these patients' tumors would predict whether they benefited from post-diagnosis aspirin use. So this was actually a separate cohort. This was the nurses who got colon cancer. Uh, who, for whom we have their tumors. And so the nurses who took aspirin after colon cancer diagnosis, as you can see, had a 29% improvement in their cancer-specific mortality overall. What about if we look at the COX-2 expression of tumors? About a third of tumors were COX-2 negative, and you can see taking aspirin didn't reduce their cancer mortality at all, a relative risk of 1.22. But among the two-thirds of patients who had COX-2 overexpressing tumors, aspirin use reduced their cancer mortality by 61%.
suggesting even a biomarker by which you might avail aspirin use routinely. Yet another interesting area that we wanted to look at was the intersection of energy balance pathways and inflammatory pathways because obesity is actually a pro-inflammatory state. And similarly, we think that inflammatory pathways can interact with energy balance pathways. Well, one very easy energy balance pathway to studying colon cancer is the PI3AKT pathway, which is managing energy control for the cell. And so uh, we wanted to look at colon cancers that had constitutive activation of energy balance through a activating mutation in PIK3CA or PI3K, thinking that maybe those tumors that are constitutive activated in terms of energy balance pathways, maybe they would benefit most from aspirin. So we looked at our cohort of about 1,000 patients. About 17% of the tumors have an activating mutation in PIK3CA, that is having constitutive activation of this energy balance pathway. And what we found to our surprise, and by the way, this is a reverse Kaplan-Meier curve for reasons that I still don't understand. The New England Journal made us flip it. But um, so going up is a bad thing as opposed to a Kaplan-Meier curve, time to event curve. But um, the, uh, those people who took aspirin with a PIK3CA mutated tumor actually have a profound benefit. You can see the difference between non-users and users, big difference in time to either cancer-specific mortality or total mortality in these 1,000 colon cancer patients. To our surprise, actually, that among those individuals who had a wild-type tumor, there was no benefit to aspirin. And what's even interesting is that a, a group in the United Kingdom did the same study and found the same thing, that aspirin only worked in patients whose tumors had an activating mutation in PIK3CA. So uh, it's something we have to sort through. There's a lot of other ways to activate the pathway beyond a PIK3CA mutation, like P10 loss. So we're really trying to now look through a variety of means, through expression, through other things, to say, well, what if we sort of globally look at whether if you turn on this pathway, does that more globally define people who benefit from aspirin beyond the 17% who just have an activating mutation in that one component of the pathway? Um, you know, one thing that I've been committed to doing beyond these observations is testing these things in randomized trials. So a number of years ago, I uh, convinced uh, Cancer and Leukemia Group B and SWOG to do this study to see whether adjuvant uh, celecoxib worked for stage 3 colon cancer. So uh, hopefully generating some level 1 evidence. You may say, well, why is it celecoxib or not aspirin? Don't ask. It just, uh, that's the way it played out. It started out as aspirin, but I, I guess, uh, you know, through the bureaucracy of things, it became celecoxib. But there were really no toxicity issues with the celecoxib in the study. It's fully accrued, and we anticipate getting an answer to the study uh, sometime in 2018. Um, and lastly, I mentioned the benefit of having higher levels of vitamin D on, on, uh, on, on risk. What about in terms of patient levels of vitamin D? And I can tell you, colon cancer patients are a cohort that are frequently vitamin D deficient by blood tests. So this study, CLGB8045, was a study of stage 4 colon cancer patients, and they all had baseline bloods. Um, we weren't so interested in the uh, treatment assignment, but just measuring their baseline 25 vitamin D and looking at their outcome. And what we found was that with increasing levels of plasma 25 vitamin D, there was a significant uh, improvement in mortality, so this is the risk of death in these patients, as well as a significant reduction in cancer progression, at least observational data, that higher levels of 25 vitamin D in patients can improve their outcome. As I mentioned, we are committed to studying these things in clinical trials. So we, st we started and completed this relatively modest-sized, randomized phase two study, the Sunshine study, in which we took newly diagnosed stage four colon cancer patients and randomized them to one of two arms. Everyone got the standard chemotherapy of Folfox bevacizumab, but they were concurrently randomized to 400 units of vitamin D a day, which, by the way, is the FDA-recommended dose and barely changes your vitamin D levels. If anything, if, you, uh, if you're deficient, you are still deficient when you take 400 units a day. It changes your levels about two to three nanograms per uh, milliliter, not very much. 
as opposed to a dose of 8,000 units a day for 14 days as a loading dose followed by 4,000 units a day uh, thereafter until disease progression. I, there were actually no, there were no toxicities associated with this level of vitamin D uh, whatsoever. Uh, but what we found and we just reported out was that those patients who were randomized to, uh, to the vitamin D supplementation had a significant improvement in progression-free survival. I realize it's only two months, but let me tell you, if you look at any approved drug in metastatic colon cancer, that's what the drug accomplishes with a hazard ratio of 0.69 and a log rank p-value of 0.04. Uh, moreover, in a multivariate analysis, the hazard ratio is 0.67 which was significant. So at least in a randomized phase two, evidence that supplemental vitamin D at a fairly high level seemed to have a benefit and uh, we're actually trying to negotiate with NCI for a larger uh, confirmatory effort beyond actually using all the samples that we collect in this study to better understanding the biology. So a lot of things that we think can affect risk, a number of things that we think can affect outcome. But in the last few minutes, I wanna talk about how we leverage these data towards biology. Um, and as I mentioned to you, when I got involved in these two cohorts, the Nurses Health Study and Health Professionals, I convinced them to send the blocks from community hospitals across the US, send the colon cancer blocks to a lab that I established, where in the 90s we would use whatever technology was available to characterize them molecularly. For those of you who I've been doing this for a while. That started out with pyrus sequencing, which was okay. Um, you could limit, you look at a few genes and, and various immune histochemical assays, but it's gotten far more sophisticated such that, you know, we're now really characterizing the genome, the immune uh, pattern in these cells, among other things. And what we've expanded to now is every one of these patients has gotten whole exome sequencing. We're now finishing RNA-seq to look at whole transcriptome in the tumors. We're assessing the microbiome, among other things. And what I want to show you in the last few minutes are some of the things you could, the power of these cohorts that you can leverage in terms of biology. So I mentioned we did whole exomes on them, and um, this is actually just the panoply of mutated genes that we found. Um, you know, there are other efforts afoot, smaller, like TCGA, but one thing you don't have is all the clinical data, right? And what's amazing about these cohorts uh, the nurses' health study is I don't just know what they what their history is after their diagnosis, I know their history 20 years before their diagnosis, and that's a lot harder to get in any patient cohort. So one gene that we looked at, uh, we found that RNF43, which had not really been well described in colon cancer, was mutated about 20 percent of patients, um, and moreover that it's as you may know. Uh, Mutations on RF43, RNF43 is one approach to activating the wind signaling pathway. And what those mutations do is they activate wind signaling. They're, all, they're always exclusive to APC mutations. It's just one way to activate wind signaling. By the way, it's, it only happens in microsatellite high tumors because microsatellite stable actually activate wind through APC mutations. And the other thing we realized that in this subset of patients, you could actually identify a target uh, susceptibility, which is through porcupine inhibitors, which is a way to basically prevent Wnt ligand from binding to the system in the context of an activated cell. And, and a number of companies have drugs in this space. To the bottom right are uh, some preclinical data that Maris Giannakis and others have done, and this is now actually in clinical trials for patients with colon cancer. Um, we also looked at the immune infiltrate. Um, one thing we did sort of very simple was just calculate the number of the proportion of lymphocytes in the tumor. Now, this was years ago before, uh, you know, IO became old rage. This was uh, 2009. What we found, and forgive the business of the slide, was that with an increasing lymphocyte score, you can see a diminishing colon cancer-specific mortality as well as a reduced overall mortality. You know, tumors with more lymphocytes are associated with a better patient outcome in colon cancer. We also characterized the various aspects of these lymphocytes. And so uh, after all the noise came out about PDL1, we looked at PDL1 in these patients, and we actually looked at the interaction with aspirin. And what we find is that among patients whose tumors are, uh, who have low expression of PDL1, that target of checkpoint inhibition, 
that actually there's a significant benefit to aspirin in the red, but actually not among the patients whose tumors um, overexpress PDL1, which we thought was interesting and maybe suggests that targeting COX-2 and PDL1 might be either additive or synergistic. And to our surprise, around the same time, somebody published in Cell and a few other papers that you can actually augment the effects, at least in animal models, of PD-1 antibodies if you combine them with a COX-2 inhibitor or aspirin, so an area that's something that we're investigating further. Um, we also just looked at the predict genomic predictors of an immune infiltrate using our whole exome data. This is just um, looking at uh, the nature of mutations, the sort of sheer number of mutations, and I can tell you up here are Paul E mutated colon cancers, rare but well described. These are microsatellite unstable tumors, and the green are all the microsatellite stable, realizing there's even a range of mutational burden among MSS. But um, what you can clearly see is, you know, using a, a algorithm developed at the Broad Institute, my colleagues and I decided to calculate neoantigens, uh, which we think may be the driver of why hypermutated tumors are. Uh, uh, affecting the immune response, and you can see that you see a lot more, no surprise, the highest level of new antigens are in Paul E mutated, second highest in MSI as compared to MSS. So we looked at neoantigen abundance and lymphocyte score. Now this is a log scale, by the way, uh, on the y-axis. You can see with increasing uh, new antigens, there is a profound increase in the proportion of lymphocytes, um, and moreover that we find a particular pattern of lymphocytes in these tumors most prominently the presence of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in those tumors that have the highest level of neoantigens. Uh, we also, as I looked at the subsets of the T cells in these patients' tumors, finding that uh, CD45RO cells or those memory T cells were in the greatest abundance in those tumors that are hypermutated and more appropriately having a high neoantigen load. And then lastly, we just looked at neoantigen load in patient survival, finding that those patients whose tumors have the highest calculated neoantigen load do a lot better. So in sum, I think a lot of data now in colon cancer that a high neoantigen load increases the infiltration of lymphocytes, the presence of memory T cells, and survival, um, all relevant because, as you may know, um, hypermutated colon cancers benefit from checkpoint inhibitors. These are data from colleagues at Hopkins who you looked at pembrolizumab, a PD-1 antibody, showing that in the green, MSI high or mismatch repair or hypermutated colon cancers are the ones that benefit so that this year the FDA approved checkpoint inhibitors for MSI high colon cancers because MSS patients don't respond. One thing we wanted to understand, though, is uh, what else is going on in these cells. And one thing we also found through our examination of the whole exome data was a series of other mutations, namely mutations in the antigen-presenting machinery of hypermutated cells. So, uh, so it, this, it, what we're looking at is the proportion of tumors with, um, HLA, with HM mutations by the, inf the, the tumor lymphocyte score. And as you can see, with more lymphocytes, there is a greater proportion of mutations in HLA in both uh, all tumors as well as microsatellite tumors, which we suspect may be sort of an acquired mechanism of survival for these tumors, right? They want to prevent the immune system from recognizing them. So, you know, if you can't hide the neoantigens, well, then shut down your antigen-presenting machinery. And in fact, down here, it just lists all, it wasn't just HLA uh, mutations. We saw mutations in all sorts of components of antigen presenting machinery in tumors that had uh, lymphocytes, um, which is sort of a cautionary tale because, you know, as we start to develop more checkpoint inhibitors, um, if these cancers get resistant to checkpoint inhibition through this mechanism, Namely, figuring out how to prevent the presentation of antigen, we can develop checkpoint inhibitors until we're blue in the face. It ain't going to work. So I don't mean to be a, put a sour note on all of our progress in immunotherapy, but I think this finding was a little sobering in terms of what colon cancers are doing as a means to prevent an immune infiltrate. Um, there are pathways that we want to understand um, how that's driving the generation of an immune response. 
This was data um, from colleagues in Chicago showing that wind signaling activation in melanoma actually uh, was associated with suppression of an immune response. We actually looked at that in our cohort. So this is just looking at expression data uh, in terms of wind signaling through axon. So with increasing expression of activation of the wind pathway, there as you can see what looks like a trend towards diminished lymphocyte infiltration. Moreover, if we just look at beta, nuclear beta-catenin as a measure of wind activation, we actually see that high levels of nuclear beta-catenin are associated with a much diminished level of tumor infiltrate, lymphocyte infiltrate, suggesting that wind activation may be a means of inhibiting this response and may be an area of improving, augmenting the response, maybe converting cold tumors to so-called hot tumors. As well, another area of interest that we're working on with Kurt Schalper as part of our Stand Up to Cancer grant is MAP kinase. As you may know, there's a growing body of evidence that MAP kinase inhibition in, tel in tumors could inhibit an immune response. So um, this was data from some trials we had done looking at various approaches to inhibit MAP kinase in colon cancer. In the red were BRAF mutated patients who underwent uh, treatment with a BRAF inhibitor. In the blue were patients who had a KRAS inhibitor who underwent a MEK inhibitor plus another investigation agent. And what Kurt actually looked at was the, the amount of uh, T cells, CD4 and CD8 infiltrates before and after that inhibition of MAP kinase. You can see there is a dramatic increase in CD4 and CD8 after those MAP kinase inhibiting approaches, suggesting perhaps that that could be another way to convert a cold colon cancer to a hot one because activation of MAP kinase is all too common in colon cancer. And as you may know, there's also preliminary data from Genentech that when they combined a MEK inhibitor with their PDL1 antibody, they are seeing some responses as part, of, which has been developed into a larger effort in colon cancer. And then in the final moments, one thing we have discovered is we were part of separately a whole genome analysis uh, of colon cancers with Matthew Meyerson, where uh, Matthew and his colleagues kept noticing the presence of a fusobacterium genome, that, you know, and something was not human in the whole genome data that kept popping up uh, in about 10 to 15 percent of patients. And one might think, well, it's just a contaminant, you know, wash your hands before you do the sequencing. But it just kept showing up. And so what Matthew and colleagues did was he, he actually did sort of Koch's hypothesis. He took AP, sin, AP sin, in mice who were in a uh, sterile environment, uh, and he fed them various organisms, be it fusobacterium, which we kept seeing popping up, streptococcus or a sham, and he found that uh, the, the mice, the, the APC mice that had been fed fusobacterium had more polyps and larger polyps. And that moreover, when he looked at the tumors, he saw in those mice that got uh, fed fusobacterium, there was a predominance of myelin-derived suppressor cells in the tumors, suggesting maybe that this is driving risk and maybe even influencing the immune response. And as we know, there is now a growing body of evidence that the microbiome can affect response to PD-1 antibodies. This was a study published in Science looking at bifidobacterium, showing that bifidobacterium can actually either augment or, or inhibit, uh, depending on how you look, the response to PD-1-directed therapy. So we actually looked more specifically at fusobacterium in our patients. And we find that those patients who have fusobacterium in their tumors, which about 15% of patients, have a worse outcome in the red. Moreover, we actually looked and find, much to that earlier data, that they actually have a much lower lymphocyte infiltrate in their tumors. And here's where it gets interesting is you actually find fusobacterium most prominently in microsatellite unstable tumors, the tumors that you're supposed to get an abundant lymphocyte infiltrate. But if a microsatellite unstable tumor in our data has fusobacterium in it, they don't get a lymphocyte infiltrate, um, and they do worse. So uh, interesting, uh, more to follow in terms of how we can better understand this. But as well, getting back to my original studies, who gets fusobacterium in their tumors? So we wanted to say, is there any diet that matters? And so I went back and looked at that Western and Prudent data. And yes, those people who eat a Western pattern diet are 
1.9 times more likely to have fusobacterium in their colon cancer as opposed to the prudent people who were far less likely to have fusobacterium in their tumor. So at the end where I started my career, uh, you know, there's still an opportunity to study more. So in sum, through a collaboration of lots of folks, um, we've managed to figure out how to use cohort data um, to understand not only risk, treatment, uh, but biology. And so as we continue to build our translational core and access of samples and data at Yale, this is really the power, I think, what we can do across multiple malignancies. So thank you for the privilege of sharing that data with you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Vince. Right. So for those of you who couldn't hear, uh, Dr. DeVita asked um, about dose. And I will tell you, in our risk studies, more is better. In contrast to cardiovascular where 81 milligrams works, and works just as well, if not better, than anything else for heart disease prevention, for colon cancer, we find greater the dose, the, 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 the greater the reduction in risk. In the outcome data, we find the same thing, that higher doses confer a better outcome. Yeah, so are there data about metformin? And it's something that we have looked at because we have, diet, we have medication use data. It's, um, it's problematic partly because um, metformin probably hits a lot of different pathways. It may not hit the right pathway as well. So we see a slight benefit for diabetics uh, who take metformin compared to not taking metformin in colon cancer risk. But I, I don't trust the data because there's just too much potential confounding. There are some studies in other cancers looking at metformin as either in risk or outcome that we'll just wait and see. And we actually have a, a, we had a, we have a randomized trial at my old center of metformin in colon cancer patients, which um, should probably read out in about a year. But it's, it's been complicated to fully understand it. No, so we didn't see any interaction between, any negative interaction between aspirin use and their chemotherapy in terms of side effects or uh, effects of the adjuvant therapy. Uh, you know, it, the, the aspirin they were taking was typically pretty modest. It was usually maybe one adult tablet per day or something, but we didn't see any negative interactions per se. To what extent can you generalize this to other cancers? What's been looked at? Even perhaps the bacteria in the gut? Right. So the question is, how can you generalize this to other cancers? And I think, obviously, much like everything else we do in cancer biology, you really have to look at each cancer individually. There is a growing body of work in breast cancer. I know Melinda Irwin and others are looking at energy balance in terms of outcome for patients with breast cancer. I think compelling evidence that exercise improves the outcome for them. There's evidence, for instance, that in terms of upper GI cancers, esophagus and gastric, that aspirin can reduce risk and maybe even benefit an outcome, though it's a tricky thing because they tend to get GI bleeding. But um, I think one has to try to apply these approaches individually. We have been doing a lot of this with uh, pancreatic cancer recently, and I haven't shown this data, and we recently recruited a, a guy, Mandar Musandar, who's doing mouse modeling that uh, sort of I've been collaborating with on pancreas. But there's ample evidence, and this is counterintuitive, obese patients with pancreatic cancer do worse. And Mandar has similar data in animals. Patients with, and, and, and patients who do things that inhibit energy balance pathways with pancreatic cancer probably do better. So I think there are opportunities to look at these in other cancers, but you have to, I think you have to be careful about doing it individually within the cancer. Well, again, thank you for your attention. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>